theme has been witness, oops, excuse me, our theme has been witness to the resurrection as we live in the resurrection. And throughout this, this uh, Easter season, we've been focusing on that, that we know that Christ is alive, and we want to share that and witness that. And so our themes have been witnessing it through our lives, that we live as resurrection people and live in that hope in the way we live in this world. Second time, week we met, we talked about uh, witnessing through our words. That is, we talk about death and resurrection, we want to make sure that the words we use when we talk about that are biblical words, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about, out there, and there's a lot of things that Hollywood has created about what happens at death and those kinds of things. And so we want to be sure that we speak the truth of God's Word and speak biblically about resurrection hope. Last week, our focus was witnessing by our death, that we prepare for everything else in this world, and it's important for us to be prepared also in our death. And so those are, there are things that we should do ahead of time, preparing our families, making sure our families know the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, making sure they know for sure and certain that not because of anything we do, but all because of what Christ has done, that we're going to be in heaven after we die, and that our bodies will be raised to life and reunited and spend all eternity uh, with the Lord. And so today now we come to witnessing by our memorial service. The memorial service is the very last opportunity that we have to give a public witness of our faith and trust in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today's service is going to be a lot like a memorial service, the way we do them here at St. John's. And throughout the service, Pastor Mike and I are both going to be speaking at various points, explaining different parts of the service and why we do those parts of the service and the significance involved in them. When someone dies, there are different ways in which we grieve and process and work through that grief, and there are different things that happen to help us in that process. There are the family gatherings. There are the memories that are shared regarding our loved one. There are flipping through the photo albums and going through pictures and things. There are uh, receptions and, and gathering together that are all important and significant ways in helping us work through grief and process through grief. The memorial service is about a service of hope and coming to hear the Word of God and His peace and, excuse me, and the certainty that we have in Jesus Christ. Our memory verse for today, uh, Paul writes, Brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul doesn't say we aren't to grieve as Christians, but he says our grief is to be different. Because in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our sadness, we grieve with hope. And that hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the certainty of life. And so when we gather for a, a memorial service, it is a celebration of life. But when we use that phrase here, it's not the way it's often used in our world today. It's not a celebration of the life, the earthly life of the deceased. It's a celebration of the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a celebration of the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. It's a celebration of the certainty and the hope that we have that our loved one who has died, believing and trusting in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, their soul is with the Lord. And it's a belief and celebration of the fact that we know that the day will come when Christ will come in all of His glory and raise all of the dead, and our loved one will be reunited body and soul, and we will be reunited with them. And so that's what we celebrate. That's what we focus on. In the midst of our tears, in the midst of our grief, we have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
there are two resources for you in today's uh, bulletin. One is a pamphlet that we give out to families that kind of walks through the service. Also, other items that uh, have to do with uh, the time of death and a memorial service. Invite you to read through those things to keep that. Okay? Uh, the other is a planning sheet. And it's a sheet for you to plan your own memorial service or someone else's. And as we walk through things, you may want to jot down notes as, you, as we go through the, the service today. Again, the memorial service is our last opportunity to witness publicly in regards to our, our faith in, in Christ Jesus. So I invite you to use those. If you need an extra copy, we'll have those available in the church office. And then that planning sheet is something you want to share with your family. Or you can even bring it to the church and we'll put it on file here as well. Typically, the memorial service then begins with the singing of a song. And so we invite you to please stand as we sing the first song. next thing that happens in a memorial service is what happens typically every Sunday when we gather, and that's an invocation. And the familiar words, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, why do, why do we say that? Why is that important? Why do we include it? Well, one thing, it identifies this is a Christian worship service. This is in the name of the triune God, the only God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But also, there's a connection here. Those same words those are the same words that are spoken that our Lord gave to His church for baptism, right? We're baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptized, as Paul tells us in Romans 6, into the death and resurrection of Christ. And so it's appropriate as we celebrate the resurrection in a memorial service, and we begin with this reminder of the identity, the covenant identity of the person who has passed away, who is now with the Lord, baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, this candle, our Paschal candle, our Christ candle, now we have it out during the Easter season the whole time, and, it, and, it's, and it's lit. Well, even if this weren't the Easter season and we're having a memorial service, we bring out the candle. Two times we bring out that candle besides the Easter season baptisms, memorial services. The connection there. As we are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ, and then we gather to celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ and our own death, own resurrection promise in death. And so that's a reminder also for us every time we say those words. We're being reminded of our identity in Christ, our connection to His death, His resurrection, the hope of everlasting life. And so we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Throughout the generations, the Psalms have brought great comfort to the people of God. And as we read through some of the Psalms, we hear the psalmist crying out in anguish, to the Lord in the struggles of life and the difficulty of life, but we also hear the psalmist always refrain, but my trust is in you. You are my God. You are my rock. You are my strength. You are my hope. And so it's very fitting for us to, to read a psalm, and there are different psalms that are very appropriate for a memorial service. Psalm 46, Psalm 121, Psalm 130. Probably the one that is most requested is the 23rd Psalm, the Psalm that brings us the, the hope and the assurance and the knowledge that our Lord is our shepherd who nurtures us, who protects us, and because of that we have no fear. Our tradition has been of late that when we read the 23rd Psalm in a memorial service, we also integrate into that John chapter 10 which tells us that Jesus is not only our shepherd, he's the good shepherd. The good shepherd who laid down his life for us, the sheep, and gives us life. So we read responsibly Psalm 23, John chapter 10. 
I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now, this next portion of the service, next that we're going to do, is something we don't do at memorial services, uh, and that is going into the confession, forgiveness, and the Lord's Supper. But I want to talk about why we don't do that at memorial service. We're doing it anyhow today because it's Sunday, and we're the people of God, and we're gathered around this table. But the Lord's Supper is clearly depicted in Scripture as the family covenant meal for the people of God as we gather together. And it is given to us, it's Christ's body and blood and the bread and the wine for, the, for this covenant celebration, reminding us of who we are, strengthening us in that. When we gather for a memorial service, we have lots of people with us, and generally lots of people who are not part of the Christian family. And so rather than dividing those who come together to worship, we refrain from having the Lord's Supper at that time. Because it is, as I said, Scripture depicts, it is the family covenant meal. Now, today we're gathered as the family of God, and so we will celebrate. So let's come before the Lord now, acknowledging our need for His grace and confessing our sin. Let's take a moment in silence before the Lord to confess our need for Him. The good news, of course, is the cross and the resurrection. Jesus shedding his blood, Jesus rising again, that amazing grace we just sang about. Our chains are gone, are broken. And although we do not have, as part of a normal memorial service, a confession, forgiveness, that truth is proclaimed loud and clear, that in Jesus Christ is our salvation. And that salvation, that forgiveness is here for each one of us, that amazing grace flooding down upon us. And it's here for us to hear with our ears. It's here for us to taste. And the bread and the wine is body and blood as we gather around His table as we come forward. For our Lord Jesus Christ, the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He gave it to His disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Come forward to receive... Lord's Supper, we will also sing, uh, and these two songs that we are going to sing are songs that we have used here at memorial services, have been requested, and in fact, I would like sung at my own memorial service, because they point to the resurrection 
They point to the hope. They point to the confidence that we have in what Christ has done. Now, this is one of the areas, of course, you want to give attention to in thinking about and planning about what scripture readings. You know, when we're faced with, with death and the grave, sometimes our own words fail us, but God's word never fails. God's word is always there. Which word do we want to have heard at our own service? Which word at the service of a loved one? And here we're, we're thinking not just about you know, my favorite passage or a very familiar passage or one that I might have heard somewhere else, but those places in Scripture that speak of the hope that we have, those words that give us strength and confidence in the face of death, in the face of loss, those words that speak of resurrection, that speak of victory, that give us comfort and peace. Now, the first reading uh, today is, is a text that, that I, I chose for this service today because it's one that I want read at my own memorial service, Romans 8, 31 to 39, very powerful, powerful section of Scripture from Paul. And I want that read not for me. I'll be with the Lord. All will be fine for me. I'm thinking about my loved ones and those that I would leave behind. And this passage, which you know, read in just a minute here, points out so powerfully that nothing, absolutely nothing in this world, including death and loss, can stand in the way of the love of Christ and can separate us from the love of Christ. That when things may seem like they're all falling apart around us, this love of Christ is a rock that nothing can shake and nothing can take away from. So these are words that I'd want read at my own service to those that I love those that I leave behind. What then, Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You just feel the power of those words and the comfort of those words. How all-inclusive Paul's describing. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not even the grave, because he has conquered the grave. And in him, as Paul says, we are more than conquerors. Truly words of hope and strength and courage. Very appropriate for our memorial service. I love the book of Revelation. I find it full of hope, comfort, and incredible visions that John saw. I love chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. The throne room of God. All the angels, the elders, and the four living creatures worshiping and praising God. Chapter 5 is about the coronation of Christ after his life here on earth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. He is the victorious lamb, and it is celebrated in heaven as we celebrate it here on earth. The last chapters of Revelation speak of the new Jerusalem, 
the hope, what we look forward to, and speak of Christ's second coming, his coming again. Well, my favorite part, chapter 7. The vision that John has of the multitudes of the people, every nation, every tribe, gathered together around the throne of God. This passage is about the fulfillment. It's about what's coming. It's about the resurrection as all are gathered in heaven around the throne of God. And the incredible thing about this vision is as John stood there and saw this vision, as he looked out there upon the crowd, he saw himself standing there. He saw you and me and all who believe in Jesus Christ standing there. The fulfillment. We live in the now and the not yet. It's already ours because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. The not yet, we don't have it in the fullness. That's coming. Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. That great tribulation is living life here in a broken and sinful world. These are they who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, living in the grace and the forgiveness of God. And now standing before the throne of God, dressed in white, with palm branches, celebrating victory. And the tent of God is over them. His protection forever. The fulfillment, the completeness. Never again will there be hunger. Never again will anybody be thirsty. Never again will anybody be overwhelmed by life and scorching heat. Because the Lamb is our shepherd who brings us to living water, who gives us life, and God wipes away every tear. Every tear that's been cried in agony, every tear that's been cried in grief, every tear that's been cried in pain and frustration, every tear that's been cried in disappointment and worry, every single tear for all eternity, God will wipe away. And we pray, 
Come, Lord Jesus, come. I know what I talk about an optional thing that sometimes comes at the very beginning of the service. And that's a remembrance. And there's, uh, in that folder, that little handout, there's a paragraph that talks about the remembrance. And this is when a, a family member may uh, get up and speak. Again, this is an optional thing. Uh, sometimes it's done, sometimes it's not done. But just wanted to point out what this remembrance is to be about. It's, it's not intended to be a eulogy. And it's not intended to be a time of an open microphone where people get up and, and speak. Um, those things are important, but the best place for those are within family gatherings or within receptions, that those just work really well in those, those settings. Um, but when uh, that it's been requested that, that someone speak, what the, we want them to, to talk about is to talk about something that will bring comfort for those who are gathered together for the memorial service, something that focuses on the hope that we have in the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. And one of the things we require is we, we want to see what's going to be said ahead of time, that we want it to be written out, we want to read through it. A couple of reasons. One, we want to make sure that it's biblical. You know, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of things that are out there that people say that aren't biblical when it comes to, to death and, and resurrection. So we want to make sure it's truly biblical, that's what's said. The other thing is it falls in the whole area of pastoral care, and we want to make sure what's said is comforting for those who gather together. We want to make sure that it's not something that's said that, that can cause emotional exhaustion for the family or maybe even embarrassment. And so we want to see those things ahead of time. But today, I want to encourage you, if, if this is something you'd like to have done, I want to encourage you to write it yourself. Again, talking about this planning. Write what you want said at the very beginning. Again, you may say, no, I don't want anything said at the very beginning, but if you do, I encourage you to write it yourself. Or maybe even write a prayer for those who are going to be gathered together. Let me give you an example. So people are gathered together for a memorial service, and the service starts with the pastor coming out and doing a welcome, and then saying, I would now like to read a prayer that your loved one wrote for this day. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in life and in death, we are yours. Throughout my life on earth, you blessed me with baptismal grace guided me by your word, nourished me with the body and blood of Christ, forgave all my sins, empowered me for service in your kingdom, and by the working of your spirit kept me in the true faith until you received my soul into your perfect presence. Continue to pour out these same blessings to all who are gathered here today. Do not let sorrows overcome them. Mix hope and faith with sadness and tears. Enable them by your Spirit to fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Give to all who grieve my death the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The service would then begin with the opening song. Now let's jump back to where we are in the service, at which point the message or, or sermon would come, an opportunity for the pastor to say a few words. And once again, as you're probably picking up on the general theme here, it's all about pointing to Christ. It's ultimately all about pointing to Christ, His victory over death, the power of the resurrection, and that reality now being given to the one who's passed away. 
who's now living, living the fulfillment of that hope and being with Christ and awaiting the resurrection. Once again, as Pastor Mark said about the remembrances, it's not intended to be a, a eulogy as it's common understood, just speaking of the, the life and rehearsing the life and accomplishments um, and, and the, um, of, the, of the person who passed away. Now, that being said, we do, in, in speaking a, a memorial service message or sermon, we do talk about the one who's passed away. We speak, we like to speak a lot about them, but it's all pointing to Christ. It's all ultimately going to serve to giving the ultimate hope that we have on that day. So we'll, I will speak of giving God thanks for His blessings to the person who has gone to be with the Lord. We'll speak of the blessings that He's poured out upon them and mention specific examples. We'll, we'll speak of the blessing above all of the gift of faith and the gift of, of knowing these truths and living in these truths, and the blessing that we know now because of Christ's gift of faith, that we know that our loved one is with the Lord. And we have that confidence as we await the reunion of the resurrection. So as, as Pastor Mark mentioned, yeah, we talk about celebration of life, but not celebration of life just looking backwards. The celebration of life, that's the resurrected life, Jesus Christ's resurrected life, the celebration of the promise of life and the gift of life to, to those who die in the Lord. And that's what we point to. And also, the looking ahead, the promise of the Lord to be with and strengthen and comfort those who are left behind. So we'll speak about that as well. So ultimately, in a, in a memorial service message or sermon here, we're going to talk about the one who passed away. And we'll speak of their faith. We'll speak of the hope, the confidence that we have. But ultimately, it's going to point to the gospel and the resurrection. And, and you think about it. If there's any time we're going to talk about the gospel and resurrection, it better be at a memorial service, right? Because we need that hope then. We need what Christ has done that gives us the only hope that we have. And also from the standpoint that when we gather for a memorial service, there's two kinds of services we do where we may likely have more non-Christians than Christians. Weddings and memorial services. So from that standpoint, if there's any time we better be clearly speaking the gospel and the blessings of knowing Christ and the blessings that he gives in his resurrection we better speak about it then, and we do, because we want all to know the truth and to receive the comfort of knowing Christ and living in the power of the resurrection. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That is the message at a memorial service. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Now we come to a part of the service that we don't do during memorials. We don't pass offering plates at memorial services. But offerings are given at the time of death. Many times uh, family members or friends will make a contribution to the church or to other organizations, hospice, American Cancer Society, those kinds of things. And so you'll notice on the planning sheet, there's room to write down where you would like gifts that are given to go and how you would like those <clears throat> designated um, and as those contributions come in. But worshiping the Lord with our tithes and our offerings is a part of our worship life, a part of our, our relationship with the Lord. And throughout our life, we give our offerings and our tithes for the work of the kingdom, for the furthering of the gospel. And so there is a time even to do that in um, making sure that the church and the, the ministry is included in our wills. Diane and I are tithers, and, but my goal has always been, I want to go beyond that. Right now, it's a little tough with two kids in college. 
But looking forward to, again, increasing and continuing to increase. My goal is I want to get to 25%. And I'm not saying it as bragging. I'm just saying I, I want to do that. But I don't know whether I'll ever be able to do that in this life. And so that's why we have made sure that we are going to continue to support the kingdom work in our death and in our wills have designated that 25% goes to the work of the Lord. When we do that, and many have done that in the past and we have an endowment fund, the wonderful blessing is that stays there. And it's the interest that continues to go towards the furthering of the kingdom. And so those kinds of gifts enables us to continue to worship the Lord over and over and over again with our tithes and our offerings. As the offerings are gathered today, we're going to sing a hymn, this next, or the song, this next song is in Christ Alone, one that I want sung at my memorial service. It's incredibly powerful. You know, it's all about Christ. That's where we stand. He is our hope. And I especially love the last stanza. Everything's been defeated, and he's got a hold on me. He's got a hold on us, and he's never letting go. And we're with him for all eternity. So we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings as we sing in Christ alone. that song just about says it all. In Christ alone is our hope. There's another opportunity to confess that, and that is in the creed. We normally use the creed. Of course, we use it every Sunday in worship, but we also include it in a memorial service. So why, why do we do that? Well, a couple of things. One is that this is, if you look at the creed, you look at the words, it's a list. It's a summary list of what God has done, the things that God has done for us, to us in this world, that is the foundation of our hope. It's because God has done these things. Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, suffered under Pontius Pilate, died, rose again at the right hand of God. This is why we have hope, because of what He has done. And to confess our faith, I believe this, I believe this, when looking at a grave, that's a witness of the resurrection, that we boldly believe that this is the hope that we have. Because you see, the Christian faith is not an announcement of some good ideas, good spiritual ideas. It's good news about events that happened, that changed the universe, and then change our lives. And so we confess those events. And these words, that's the other part of it, these words, like let's just take the Apostles' Creed, it's been used by the Christian church for coming up on 1,900 years. Okay? This, this list of things. And so when we speak these words, it's like we're being reminded that we're, we're, not, we're not just us alone. We're, we're speaking this with other Christians. This is the faith that all of us Christians share. And not just all of us who are alive today, those of the past who are now around the throne, those all over the world. So here, as we worship Sunday by Sunday, but especially as we're facing death, we are not alone. Our whole church, the church, stands with us in confessing these truths on which our hope rests. So let's stand and speak those truths, a summary from Scripture, what God has done and what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. To the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Throughout the memorial service, the Lord has been speaking to us through his word and through song. And then there comes that time in the service, our opportunity speaking back to the Lord based on his word, based on his promises to us as we come to him in prayer. And the prayers during the, the memorial service focus on comfort for those who are grieving, trusting in the assurance of God's promises that are real through Jesus Christ, and asking for the Lord to continue to bless so that we may continue to go forward living as his people, proclaiming the truth of the resurrection. And so in the prayers for today, we will include our, our regular prayers that we offer on Sunday mornings, but also will incorporate uh, prayers for those who are grieving, some that we use during the memorial service. We pray. Okay, we have one more thing to do in our memorial service, back to the memorial service. And that is the blessing, the benediction. We just spoke a blessing for Josh and Megan. And we conclude our, our services normally with, with a blessing. And I just want to point out that when we do that, we're so used to hearing it, it might seem this way. It is not the same as saying, okay, see you next week. Or have a nice day, take care. It's not just words of dismissal. It's a blessing from God. The words we normally use are what's called the Aaronic blessing, Aaron, Aaronic blessing, a blessing that God gave Moses to give to Aaron to give to the people. It's in Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, that blessing. And what's, what's fascinating about it is that in that passage that God gives the words, he says, these are the words Aaron is to speak over the people. And then he concludes it with saying this. He says, and so Aaron, my, Aaron will place my name on my people, and I will bless them. So one thing to think about when, when we are, are giving a blessing in the name of the Lord, and we can do this to each other, of course, and I hope you, you do it in your homes, but when you give a blessing in the name of the Lord, or a blessing here in worship, I'm not blessing you. Pastor Mark is not blessing you. I did not just bless Josh and Megan. God is blessing. And that is something. He put his name on, on you, his name, and that brings blessing. And so we, we go out from this place with the name of our God upon us, his grace and blessing on us to enter into the week of the mission field wherever we are. And that is especially appropriate, don't you think, at a memorial service? When here we are grieving and our hearts are aching to have, as we, we came in with the name of God, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we go out with the name of God placed upon us to bless us, to strengthen us, and send us on our way. It is a gift from God to which we respond, amen. And now, I just want to point out a little pet peeve of mine. When we speak a blessing and the amen is, amen, mm -hmm. kind of a mumble, this is the name of our God upon us. This is the blessing. And so we respond with boldness, amen. So be it, those, that word means. Yes, Lord, I receive that blessing. Lay it on me. I need it. So we'll do the blessing in just a minute, and then we'll sing one more worship song. Uh, first song of Isaiah. Those who've been at St. John's for quite a while know this song. Uh, this is an, kind of an important song in our, in our St. John's culture. We sing it at important events. But also it's been requested at many, many memorial services because it is a song of comfort and peace. Surely it is God who saves me. And also it's a fitting conclusion to our Witness to the Resurrection series, that bridge, that third, second, second stanza, make his deeds known among the nations. His deed above all, the resurrection in Jesus Christ, the resurrection he has planned for us. So, 
Let's rise to receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good, amen. Yeah. <laughs> and now let's sing our faith in our God who saves us. One, two, three.